All right, perfect. Um, so great. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please type them into the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion. Um, so here's the agenda for today. Uh, briefly, I will start out with a few remarks. Then we'll move on to some introductory comments from the Marine Science Association of Thailand, um, followed by a statement from the CBD Secretariat's Marine Expert, followed by the Pew Charitable Trust on Navigating the Seas of Change. Then we'll move into a case study from Malaysia on sustainable practices in action, followed by a recording of a sustainable sea supporting nations with FAO expertise. Then we'll have closing thoughts and reflections from Vietnam. And finally, we'll move into the Q&A session. Uh, we expect the webinar to last approximately one and a half hours. Okay, so now that that is settled, um, I would like to welcome you all once again to today's webinar. Uh, in my current capacity at Pacific Environment, I oversee projects working with governments and communities to implement effective and equitable marine resources management and fulfill 30 by 30 goals in Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Prior to this, I worked in marine resources enforcement across 16 countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa. I have seen firsthand the positive impact that sustainable fisheries can have on coastal communities, where many people are dependent on fish for food and livelihoods, as well as the impact that these can have on the protection of critical marine habitat, including coral reefs and mangroves. Today's webinar aims to focus discussion on targets five and 10 of the treaty with a specific emphasis on sustainable fisheries and highlight key strategies for further engagement. We also aim to showcase examples of impactful initiatives from various countries in Asia. We're going to hear uh, from experts on fisheries sustainability, including from our co-hosts, the Marine Science Association of Thailand and the Pew Charitable Trust, as well as the CBD Secretariat FAO and the Departments of Fisheries of Malaysia and Vietnam. So I'm going to thank you all for coming. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker. So uh, Dr. Tamasak Iman is president of the Marine Science Association of Thailand, where he plays major roles in coordinating Thai marine scientists and researchers, promoting research advancement and bridging science and national policy. He has worked at the Marine Biodiversity Research Group, Department of Biology, Faculty of Science, Ram Kham Heng University in Bangkok since 1992. Dr. Yeman has experience in marine ecosystems, including management, conservation, research, and administration based on nearly 30 years of field work in Thailand and other parts of the Western Pacific. Uh, so now Dr. Yeman, if you're available, um, the floor is all yours. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Sylvia, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Sagimin, the president of Marine Science Association of Thailand. On behalf of the Marine Science Association of Thailand, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the Pew Territorial Trust and Pacific Environment for inviting us to be a co sponsor and allowing me to deliver an in introductory comment for this event. Before moving to each speaker, I would like to highlight the importance of the marine biodiversity relations to fisheries and why do we need to conserve biodiversity to secure fisheries sustainability. Next, please. Okay. First of all, I would like to highlight the importance of marine biodiversity, which is a vital component of ecosystems and services. As present, about uh, 245,000 marine species have been described and enlisted in the World Register of Marine Species website. As you can see on the map, the distribution of marine species also relies on the, the availability of ecosystem, particularly coral reefs, seagrass beds, mangrove, other type of coastal wetland. Based on the distribution data of fish, marine mammals, and seabirds, 
we have at least six regions of marine hotspots, particularly Asia Pacific region. Next, please. If we focus on the Asia Pacific region, the IBES global assessment identified that the tropical to temperate Western Pacific areas and the Eastern Indian Ocean areas are one of the global marine biodiversity hotspots. The map on the right hand side is the distribution of the red list species or potentially extinct or endangered species in the Asia Pacific region. The assessment also shows that the threats to the marine biodiversity are relatively high in the coast of South Asia and Central Indian Ocean. Next, please. A global assessment reveals the risk of extinction in marine biodiversity. About nearly 13,000 marine species were assessed by the IUCN in 2018, and it turns out that 9% of assessed species are either critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable, vulnerable, and thus considered threatened with extinction. If we look at the marine species threatened with extinction, that they were assessed with critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. Bonifacious has the highest proportion, followed by anthozoans and cartilaginous fish. Overall, habitat destruction and direct exploitation of fisheries are the main threats of biodiversity loss. Some taxonomic groups are more vulnerable to climate change and pollution and invasive species. For example, coral reefs, marine mammals, and birds. Next, please. Fisheries seem to be one of the main causes of biodiversity loss due to direct exploitation and collateral impacts. Fishing mortality caused the reduction of fish abundance declining in mean trophic levels. Collateral impacts of fishing refers to bycatch and unintentional or incidental damages to habitats caused by fishing activities. Those impacts can alter ecosystem function by changing in predator-prey interaction, competitive interaction, and change in marine food webs. Next, please. Fisheries were mentioned in the IG Target 6 of the CBD Strategic Plan for Biodiversity in 2011 to 2020, aiming to reduce adverse fishing impacts on threatened species and vulnerable ecosystems. However, the global biodiversity outlook shows that this target has not been achieved as many fisheries are still causing overfishing unsustainable levels of bycatch of non-target species and damages of marine habitats. Next, please. In the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, fisheries are still mentioned in both target five and 10, focusing on both sustainable use of wild species and sustainable management of fishing cows. This reflects that we still need to put lots of efforts to manage fishing activities in sustainable ways for viability of ecosystems and livelihoods. Mr. Joe Appiot from CBD will talk about this in details later on. Next, please. FAO has been promoting a wide range of efforts in reducing fishing impacts on environment. For example, code of conduct for responsible fisheries. In the sense of fisheries management, the concept of ecosystem-based approach has been applied, shifting from single or multi-species to ecosystem approach to fisheries, which has been introduced and implemented in many countries around the world. And recently, FAO has just discussed the mainstreaming biodiversity in fisheries management, which is a good sign of FAO support to GBF implementation. 
Dr. Kim Friedman from FAO will give you a summary of such discussion later on. Next, please. Finally, as a co-sponsor, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers and all our participants for joining this event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeeman. Uh, so next up, we're going to hear from Dr. Joseph Appiat. Uh, he unfortunately could not be here live, so we will be listening to a recorded presentation. Uh, Dr. Appiat is the coordinator of the Marine Coastal and Islands Biodiversity Programs of Work at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD. At the CBD Secretariat, he works with governments, international organizations, and other stakeholders to facilitate the implementation of the convention and the achievement of global goals for biodiversity. Dr. Appiat has a PhD and MS in Marine Policy from the University of Delaware and a BS in Marine Biology from the University of Miami. So next up, we will hear from him. Greetings, friends and colleagues. My name is Joe Appiat. I coordinate the work on marine, coastal, and and island biodiversity here at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's a great pleasure to address this webinar through this recorded presentation. Apologies, I can't be there with you during the actual webinar, but I appreciate our friends at Pew and the Marine Science Association of Thailand for allowing me to address you in this uh, recorded fashion, which I hope is useful for your, uh, for your discussions. Now, in December 2022, the global community took a massive step forward in adopting the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework at the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the CBD. This was a major step forward for, uh, for, the, for the world in that it really represented the most ambitious set of, of, of goals and targets for nature that we've ever seen. Now, the framework itself is uh, rather uh, complex and detailed and reflects many different aspects of what needs to be done to put humanity and nature on, on, a, on a more sustainable pathway. But much of the attention and action, of course, has been focused on the action targets, the things that we need to do by 2030. Now, there are 23 action targets organized across these general thematic areas, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to get into all of these. So what I'm going to do is zoom a little bit in on those that are specific, uh, that is that are relevant and, and actually not only relevant, but require the action of fisheries world. Um, and, and hopefully this can kind of give you a, a bit of a better idea of where fisheries can fit into the target, into the framework. Now, as I said, there are many targets, and in fact, most of the framework I would say is relevant in many ways to the fisheries world, but there are some specific targets that will require the strong action of the fisheries community and those in the fisheries world. Um, this includes target one on integrated biodiversity inclusive spatial planning, ensuring that all areas are under integrated biodiversity inclusive spatial planning. Target two on restoration of degraded spaces and, and habitats and ecosystems. Target three, the famous 30 by 30 target, um, which calls for protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. And of course, we know that um, sectors and actors and users of, of biodiversity in different spaces do um, can and do play an important role in area-based conservation. And we need to uh, really uh, find uh, the, the ways to engender positive collaboration in area-based conservation and protected areas. Target four on, on reducing the uh, extinction of known threatened species. Um, target five, um, which I'll come back to shortly, and I think we, we all know is the focus of, of this uh, of this webinar. Target nine, which actually looks similar, similar to target five, looks at sustainable use, but looks at it from the other side in terms of maximizing the benefits to be derived from sustainable use. Target 10, I'll come back to in just a second. Um, which focuses on areas under, under management of, specific, of, of different sectors. And uh, target 18, focusing on subsidies. And of course, we know that fishery subsidies have become a really prominent area of focus. Now, zooming in on these, uh, this subset of targets that, that, that you're focusing on here, although, as I said, many, many targets will require robust action from fisheries. And target five um, really focuses and zooms in on sustainable use, harvesting, and trade of, of, of wild species. And it has a number of those elements. I've broken down the target into its elements there. But as you can see, this is really the successor to Aichi Biodiversity Target 6, focusing specifically on harvesting practices and approaches. And in this regard, it's very much, very much the core business of, of fisheries management. Now, target 10 is an interesting one because target 10 looks at areas under 
management of productive sectors. Now, this is a successor to IG Biodiversity Target 7, but Target 7, IG Target 7, did not address fisheries. It didn't include fisheries. It focused on, on agriculture and, and, and forestry more so. So the inclusion of, of, of fisheries in this target actually signifies an important recognition that fisheries communities, fisheries sector, and authorities all have really important roles in managing the areas that are being fished, the broad spaces of, of, of areas being fished, and are important stewards of biodiversity in these spaces. And we need to push, uh, push that role and encourage that role and make sure that we're actually playing that role in the fisheries world. Now, Jeep, the, 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 the framework emphasizes the importance of a comprehensive and holistic approach, emphasizing that we need actions across a broad range of, 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 of realms, not just an area-based conservation or production or consumption, but all of them together in a part of a collective whole. But of course, uh, it's overwhelming to look at all 23 of these targets together. We can't expect everyone to do everything. So that's why we're really pushing the importance of looking at targets holistically at the planning level but at the implementation level, recognizing that most um, will deal with directly with a few targets, but need to see other targets through the lens of, of the targets that they're really focusing on. So I really encourage you when you're taking forward action on targets five and 10 to not lose sight of the other targets in terms of especially those that are really speaking to the qualitative aspects of how to do this and how to actually make the outcomes real and sustainable. So to close up, um, we have heightened ambition requiring urgent action and scaled up action. We need to improve our enabling conditions. We need a broader group of stakeholders to get involved, involved in biodiversity action than have traditionally been. And we need to broaden our discussions and perhaps have some uncomfortable discussions to engage more stakeholders in positive solutions. But at least now we have a strong political impetus and opportunity by the GBF to gain support for the for work on scaling up, uh, scaling up our work on biodiversity and sustainability, including in the fishery sector and all sectors and all facets of society. So I hope this was helpful and I wish you the best for your uh, discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to Dr. Abiyat. Um, next up is Andrew Clayton who directs Pew's Ecosystem Conservation and Fisheries work, um, which aims to improve ecosystem resilience through better international fisheries governance using science-based policy development and advocacy. He is based in London. Prior to his current work at Pew, Mr. Clayton oversaw Pew's efforts to end overfishing in Northwestern Europe. He holds a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of Wales in Aberystwyth. And uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Clayton. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to think about the context for fisheries management and how fisheries management is done at the moment. So over the last century, or so, traditionally, fisheries management has focused on maximizing productivity without exploitation. So the uh, metrics and the aims and the, the kind of legislative objectives that have been used in fisheries management have all been about maximizing the, the amount of fish that we can extract from wild populations. And that has helped the uh, fishing fleets around the world to maximize the amount of fish they produce, the profit they can make, the jobs that they can sustain, and um, to put food in hungry people's mouths as well. So the, the focus of fisheries management at least at least in the in the latter half of the uh, last century, it was about maximizing productivity. And that's why um, the, the metrics used in things like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, they refer to maximum sustainable yield. This is the maximum amount that you can take from a, an individual fish population into the long term without, without damaging its ability to reproduce. And that's what the graph on this slide represents. But of course, that, by definition, focuses on a single species, a single fish population. It does not necessarily look at some things that the global biodiversity framework is looking at. It doesn't necessarily look at the wider impact of fishing activity in the ecosystems, the effect on habitats, the effect on uh, non-target species. And um, up to now, most of the focus on maximizing those yields. So to the next slide, please. 
But uh, biodiversity conservation and thinking about those wider impacts is not a new concept. So the uh, slide here shows an extract from the UN Fish Stocks Agreement from 1995, so nearly 30 years old. And this already requires fisheries managers to assess the impact of, of fishing on ecosystems, on other species uh, in the same ecosystem as target stocks. It, it calls out um, managers should protect biodiversity in the marine environment. So this is not new. And this is also articulated as an ecosystem approach or the ecosystem-based uh, fisheries management. And various international agreements um, focus on EBFM, the ecosystem approach. This is something that the FAO has produced guidance on. It was recently discussed, as we just said, in the, the January Committee on Fisheries. Um, but it's, there is patchy implementation of this concept around the world. It's been put into practice in individual jurisdictions um, on the high seas, on, a, on the international stage. The application of the ecosystem approach is relatively limited. Where it's been put into practice, it's mostly been focused on bycatch and the impact on species caught accidentally in existing industrial fisheries. There are a few initiatives around the world that focus on forage species. So these are the, the small fish that underpin ecosystems and provide food for predators. Um, there are a few initiatives around the world, including in Europe, focusing on those forage species. And there is right now a, a number of scientific tools emerging that will help managers to apply an ecosystem approach. Some of these tools are really innovative in, in changing the reference points that managers might want to use. So instead of using those points that only talk about maximizing yield, we could already have underlying in the scientific advice um, ways of managing fish stocks that safeguard things like food webs, they safeguard predator prey relationships, and they look at the wider impacts of where those species are interacting with each other in ecosystems. So biodiversity conservation in fisheries management is not a new concept, but it's so far under implemented. Next slide, please. Which brings us to targets five and 10. Um, target five, of course, uh, outlines the basics of fisheries management. So fisheries need to be sustainable, safe, and legal. We don't want to see over exploitation. But this target goes further in terms of biodiversity and minimizing the impact on non-target species and ecosystems. Um, and, and specifically calls for the ecosystem approach, just as the IQ target did. So there are additional requirements here uh, based on what managers are currently doing, even though they've had those requirements for a few decades now. So this is a good reminder to fisheries managers that they have a, a, a responsibility to apply the ecosystem approach and take extra steps to safeguard biodiversity. And I think that reminder is needed at this stage, bearing in mind uh, the, the lack of implementation of ecosystem approaches and the state of overfishing, which the FAO uh, figures will show you are getting worse year on year. We have more than a third of stocks globally overfished at the moment. Uh, next, please. Now, target 10 is slightly different in that it talks about areas. And this um, potentially gives fisheries managers a spatial target to report against, to recognize when they're taking uh, good steps to implement an ecosystem approach. We can identify and, and register areas under that kind of fisheries management. And again, this is about sustainable use. It's, in, it's not about protection. It's not, it's not about um, identifying areas under target three, the 30 by 30 objective. Um, this is about identifying areas in the, in the remainder of the ocean in a 70% where sustainable use will continue, where fisheries will continue to provide food and jobs and, and, and profits. So we can use this target to record spatially um, good fisheries management. And it's, it's yet to be seen exactly how that will work. We don't yet have clear guidance on exactly what will 
qualifying areas be recorded spatially in this way. And I think we have some, some urgent work to do with the CBD, with the, the FAO to help fisheries managers identify what the criteria are for such areas. Next, please. So I, I wanted to give you my perspective on the work to elaborate on targets five and 10 so far. So my experience is that there has been little attention to these targets by the fisheries managers that I've been working with in, in, in Europe and to some degree in the uh, FAO meeting in January that the first presentation referred to. There's been quite a lot of focus on target three on 30 by 30, which I find slightly uh, unexpected because the, these targets, five and ten, very specifically talk about fisheries. They talk about exploitation of wild species. So they're, really, they're obviously really relevant to fisheries managers. And I think fisheries managers are perhaps lacking uh, clear guidance on exactly how they will deliver those targets at the moment. Um, but there's been a lot of focus on trying to deliver target three either through MPAs or through other effective conservation measures, OECMs. And that it's really dominated discussion in some regional fisheries management organizations. So to give you an example, I was involved in the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries uh, Commission. Over the last year, they've been uh, developing a process to identify their own OECMs to deliver the target three, and that really dominated proceedings for the whole of the last year, uh, really taking up a lot of their time and the annual meeting in November to identify areas that could qualify for that target which is really great because this is a sign of fisheries managers taking these GBF targets seriously and taking their responsibilities seriously. But I think we now need to also turn attention to targets five and 10. So how do we realize the vision on, on targets five and 10? I think first of all, we, uh, we need to emphasize that this is really good for fisheries and the role of fisheries. It, it, it recognizes managers' contribution to the GBF. It reinforces the role of fisheries and productivity and resilience of those fisheries as well as those ecosystems. So there's a big human and socioeconomic dimension in terms of safeguarding future fishing activity. And I have some suggestions for how we might deliver on targets five and 10 in the next slide, please. <clears throat> so I, I think we need really practical steps to deliver this. The, the ecosystem approach is a concept and it could be delivered in various ways, but I think we should focus in on the specifics of what managers can do now, things they can do this year in their management position. And I think um, some things they can do, first of all, considering food webs, considering these predator-prey roles, the way that species interact in an ecosystem, scientists increasingly have uh, de developed models that can help us to understand this, and that can feed into the fisheries decision-making process. Also concerning forage species because of their role in the ecosystem underpinning those food webs. We should also focus on bycatch. So managers have historically focused on minimizing bycatch and made some progress in that area. But we should also look at recovering and maintaining those bycatch species populations. That may require active steps by fisheries managers. We also need to protect habitat. So Fisheries managers have a role in, for example, protecting spawning and nursery grounds. These are things they can do under fisheries measures. They don't necessarily have to add up to being a protected area under target three. We should also proceed caution, particularly for those forest species and for communities with our development. Holistic planning will help us actually write down the actions that we're taking to take an ecosystem approach. We, we, we need a holistic plan that actually shows what we're doing for the whole ecosystem, not just to manage a specific population that's giving us high yields in terms of fisheries. And then finally, in my final slide, we'll deal with the metrics under the, the GBS because we cannot manage this if we do not measure it. So next slide, please. At the moment, for target five, um, under the indicator framework for the GBS, we have a headline indicator for target five that looks at the proportion of stocks within biologically sustainable levels, which is a, a perfectly sensible thing to do to, to, to measure progress on fisheries management. But that is an indicator based on its maximum sustainable yield concept. It's still looking at 
the uh, the scale of the yields that we're getting from an individual fish population is not necessarily a good indicator for all these ecosystem-based biodiversity safeguards that Target 5 requires. Now, Target 5 then goes on to include a mix of complementary indicators that get at some of these things. Uh, but I think it would benefit also from a governance indicator that looks at the ecosystem approach itself. For Target 10, the uh, indicators are even more lacking in that there are none for fisheries. So there, there is no way at the moment to, to measure whether we will make progress in fisheries on Target 10. So it's obviously an outstanding priority for policymakers to improve the monitoring framework generally, but specifically to add fisheries indicators for Target 10. And I, I think we're urgently going to need to develop um, some methodology to be able to identify those areas under Target 10 that meet the uh, requirement for ecosystem-based management. And that's going to be something we need to work on this year. And I look forward to doing that with uh, the FAO and CBD and it's Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Clayton. Uh, so next up, we're going to hear from Ms. Lim Aigake, who is currently the head of the international section under the Policy and Strategic Planning Division for the Department of Fisheries Malaysia. She holds a degree in fishery science from the University College of Science and Technology Malaysia and Masters in Sustainability Science from the University of Malaya. Uh, Ms. Lim has served 20 years in the public service uh, for the Department of Marine Park Malaysia and subsequently the Department of Fisheries. Throughout her career, Ms. Lim has been involved in international negotiations, development of policies, management of marine parks, budget planning, and legal drafting. She is also the national focal point for marine and coastal biodiversity program of work established under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, please proceed, Ms. Lim. Thank you, Sylvia, for your kind um, introduction. And um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Pacific Environment for the invitation to, to this uh, to speak at this uh, webinar. Uh, the invitation was through our strategic partner, uh, Reef Check Malaysia. So um, for that, thank you. And we hope that uh, we'll have a fruitful discussion today. So um, I will share our insights on translating the fisheries elements of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, specifically Target 5 into national policy and furthering its um, implementation. Uh, next. So um, the Kunming Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, as uh, Joe has um, explained, it is a cross-cutting um, uh, framework whereby it covers from land to marine, from human uh, health to animal health. So it is it covers a broad range of, of um, topics and, and areas. So during the nego negotiation process, Malaysia was actually very well uh, represented with expertise from various departments and research institutions uh, as well as uh, legal advisors who attended both physically and online. And negotiations, as, as Joe has put it, it was very intense and exciting and it was not easy. Um, and the outcome was, I think it was the best that we could achieve at that point of time. So as Joe has mentioned, it has four goals, 23 targets. And although Joe met, uh, in his presentation, Joe only listed eight uh, targets that are related to fisheries and aquaculture. But uh, for Malaysia, we have identified at least 11 targets that are related to uh, fisheries and aquaculture besides target uh, five and 10 that we are um, discussing about today. So uh, next, please. So. Target five, as uh, Joe and uh, Mr. Clayton has has um, explained, it um, it aims to ensure such uh, sustainable, safe, and legal harvesting and trade of uh, wild species. And in fact, uh, wild species includes marine, uh, including fish, our main food source for humans. And in Malaysia, uh, our per capita consumption of fish is 46k 
kg per year, which is, I think it is among the highest, um, among the highest, uh, and it is above um, global average, if I'm not mistaken, and demands for these resources, uh, fisheries resources, grow in parallel uh, with population and economic uh, growth. So therefore, target five is intended to address biodiversity loss through sustainable production and consumption of uh, wild species. But of course, um, for Malaysia, um, exploitation or use of fisheries resources is not the only threat, but uh, we have also identified uh, other threats that are that needs to be addressed, uh, which of course uh, may not be covered under target five specifically. Uh, specifically. Um, next, please. So, as uh, Joe has mentioned, uh, target five uh, is the direct successor of uh, target six in Aichi biodiversity target, and this target will uh, directly contribute towards goal A and goal B of the uh, framework. And it will also contribute towards uh, many other targets, which includes uh, target four, six, nine, and 11. And of course, uh, to achieve target five, um, efforts needs to go into other targets, which includes uh, target 14, 15, 16, 18, which uh, uh, which touches on subsidies uh, 21 and 22 um, in order to achieve these targets. And of course, um, target five also addresses um, uh, the SG, SDG targets, uh, which is um, which are under uh, target 12 and target for uh, target 12, 14 and 15. Um, next, please. So uh, before we move on to implementation at, at national level. I would like to touch upon uh, considerations that were um, that were included in section C uh, of the KMGBF package, whereby mm -hmm. uh, these considerations are very important to Malaysia and they are the essence of our uh, national processes. And this includes uh, contribution and rights of indigenous people and local communities, uh, whole of government and whole of society approach in uh, planning and implementation. And uh, we also, uh, we would also like to highlight that uh, these goals and targets are global goals and global targets whereby uh, implementation is a in is in accordance to national circumstances, priorities, and capabilities. And whereby at um, national level, we also put very um, high priority in terms of, of um, planning, uh, which includes, uh, which uh, puts importance in uh, science-based, uh, and we also acknowledge innovation and, and uh, uh, research and development as the essence of uh, our policy development. Um, next, please. So, <clears throat> when uh, I mentioned that uh, these uh, these goals and how these goals and targets are translated into uh, national policy, I would like to highlight here the national uh, policy on uh, biological diversity whereby um, when we mention whole of government and whole of society approach, uh, we actually do it, uh, do extensive consultations at national level, whereby when we started to develop the national uh, policy for, for um, uh, national policy on biological diversity to uh, the new, the current one, the 2020, uh, to 2030 to replace the uh, 2060 to 2025 policy, 19, six, uh, 19 stakeholder consultations were conducted whereby 12 were thematic and seven regional uh, consultations were conducted. So uh, the uh, post-2020 GBF, which was it was then uh, known as, uh, the process started in 2020, uh, sorry, uh, 2019. So to, 
to coincide with with um the start uh, the process of the uh post twenty twenty GBF uh Malaysia started our uh, review of our uh policy in twenty twenty, and when COP fifteen uh was concluded um Malaysia had our post COP fifteen harmonization whereby um we look into a uh, harmonization of of targets and and um to further uh see what uh what needs to be improved upon on the uh draft that was uh that was drafted way back in 2020 and these consultations were conducted online during the pandemic and of course we were lucky that during the uh, COP uh post COP15 harmonization, we could have uh, a few um, physical consultations. And of course, work has been easier then and um, we could have more discussions physically. Um, next, please. So um, our national policy on biological diversity, uh, we retain our original um, goals, uh, which uh, as of current, we have five goals, uh, which include uh, we have em uh, empowerment and uh, empowered uh, and harness the commitment of stakeholders to conserve biodiversity. Uh, goal two talks about uh, significantly reduce direct and indirect pressures on biodiversity. Uh, goal three uh, um, talks about our commitment to safeguard all of our key ecosystems, uh, species, and genetic diversity. Goal four is on uh, ensuring that biodiversity is used safely uh, and the benefits from the utilization are shared uh, equitably. And target five, uh, whereby we need to improve the capacity, uh, knowledge, skills of all stakeholders to conserve biodiversity. So it is um it is uh, prominent that that um these elements that we talk about in section c were embedded in our uh, processes and in our um policy and the policy statement of uh, our policy statement is malaysia is committed to conserve its biological diversity promote its sustainable use and ensure the fair and equitable uh, sharing of benefits arising uh, from the utilization of uh, biological resources. So um, the policy contains 17 targets of which uh, um, two are directly uh, related to target five of the Kunming Montreal, Kunming Montreal Global, Divers uh, Global Biodiversity Framework. And these are target six on agri-food, uh, agri-food, agri-commodities and fisheries. Uh, and target 12 is on uh, combat, uh, sorry, uh, combat uh, poaching and illegal uh, trade. Next, please. So target six, uh, further details on target six is that by 2030, uh, our agro-food, agri-commodity and fisheries production are managed and harvested sustainably whereby uh, four actions were um were listed um to strengthen our uh, to strengthen sustainable agro food and agri commodity practices uh, to reduce the impact of fisheries on marine and coastal biodiversity uh, to strengthen our aquaculture uh, planning and management and also to strengthen uh, um genetic diversity um conservation of cultivated plants farm and domesticated uh, animals and their wild relatives. Mm. While target 12 is uh, on poaching, uh, by 2030 poaching, illegal harvesting, illegal trade of flora and uh, fauna are minimized or significantly reduced. Uh, uh, four actions were uh, uh, crafted. Uh, this includes uh, combat poaching and illegal uh, harvesting of wild flora and fauna. Uh, 
uh, combat illegal trade of wild flora and fauna, reduce demand uh, through public outreach and behavioral uh, change, and as well as strengthen legislation and institutional uh, arrangement uh, for species protection. And um, this policy was uh, developed by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, uh, Natural Resources, Environment and Sustainability, our sister ministry, whereby uh, the Department of Fisheries Malaysia, uh, we are under the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Food Security. So these are two different ministries whereby, um, of course, uh, one looks at, at uh, the conservation part of of um of uh the resources whereby the ministry of uh, agriculture looks into the uh, production and ensuring that uh we have a uh, sufficient food for everyone but of course uh next slide please you would be able to notice that um sorry uh you would be able to notice that uh, our national agro food policy, which was developed prior to our uh, national policy on biological diversity, it has incorporated um, the elements of uh, sustainable use, conservation, and also um, ensuring um, that the agriculture continues to provide uh, for the people, uh, for people and also economic growth, whereby um it so uh because uh, there are four strategies that do not only contribute um uh to achieving the earlier mentioned target 6 and target 12 uh, they also play crucial roles in target 2 of uh, our national policy on biological diversity and all six targets in goal 3 of um the biodiversity policy and of course, um, bes uh, just to highlight uh, the national policy on biological diversity, the 2022-2020 is also supported by other policies and plans, which among others include uh, the, our 12th Malaysia plan, uh, our national uh, physical plan for and our National Coastal Zone Physical Plan 2, as well as our state structure plans. And on the recent development in Malaysia, uh, the Department of Fisheries Malaysia is in process of strengthening uh, our Fisheries Act 1985, whereby this is in line with our uh, National Agro-Food Policy on um, prioritise good governance across uh, the fisheries and aquaculture sector. And also um, in the recent um, development whereby uh, when Malaysia signed, uh, ratified the uh, WTO um, fisheries subsidies agreement, the central agencies has also committed to allocate consistent budget uh, for the assessment of our uh, fisheries stock. And this is important for us because this is where we could um, uh, track and, and assess the status of our resources for future planning or for remediation actions or for um, all the other plans that are uh, in force and also in the future. And um, we would also like to express that uh, we are glad that FAO has been playing an important role in advocating conservation and sustainable use of marine resources to uh, to all its members, including Malaysia. And the FAO Asia-Pacific uh, Regional Office is also working uh, closely with the Southeast Asian Fisheries Development Centre, CIVDEC, uh, to further build capacity of uh, the ASEAN member states in various uh, initiatives that contributes towards achieving um, the KMGBF. So uh, with that, uh, Malaysia, uh, DOF, uh, Department of Fisheries, looks forward to contribute towards um, the global biodiversity framework through national and regional uh, initiatives in accordance to our national uh, circumstances, uh, priorities and capabilities. Um, thank you.
Thank you so much, Miss Lim. Uh, now for our next speaker, uh, he unfortunately could not be here live, but again, he prepared some remarks for us via video. So we're going to hear from Dr. Kim Friedman, who is a senior fishery resources officer with the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or FAO. Dr. Friedman leads the resilience team, the Fish Finder Program, and is the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division's focal point for the Convention on Biological Diversity, CITES, and Small Island Developing States. He holds a PhD in Marine Sciences from James Cook University, a master's degree in Fisheries and Aquaculture from the University of Sterling, and a BS in Marine Sciences from Swansea University. Uh, so now I will go ahead and play the video. Good day, my name is Kim Friedman, and I'd just like to thank Pew and the Marine Science Association of Thailand for the opportunity to give a summary of FAO's discussions at their committee, the Subcommittee on Fisheries Management, the discussions on FAO's next steps in assisting with CBD's biodiversity plan targets. This talk presents a little on how FAO will assist its members and, and CBD parties, which overlap, measure progress in the delivery of the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Plan, just calling it a biodiversity plan um, in this talk. And it will center on how we can develop a common conversation on the status of our world, especially fisheries. One that enables us to describe the world we live in, adapt our actions and work towards a better commonly envisioned future. Okay, so the three parts of this talk, the first part, first part will be uh, why is aquatic biodiversity a priority? The second, tar, second part is how can fisheries and aquaculture boost GBF target delivery? And the third part is what is FAO and partners doing to enable such progress? Mm -hmm. So let's go to the first one. Why is aquatic biodiversity a, pro a priority? Well, we think of bony fish, for example, from the early Osteichthys, that they appeared about 400 million years ago. And that was followed by the chondrichthys, the shark-like forms, about 380 million years ago. So these aquatic life forms are some of the oldest animals on Earth. And it would be another, for example, three to 400 million years before land grasses came into being. So there's been a lots of adaptive evolution in time. And if you're looking at conserving biodiversity, uh, aquatic biodiversity and fish would be high on the list. This slide talks to the fact that aquatic systems are major players in global biodiversity, especially for animals, as we see here. Um, not only does the ocean support by far the bulk of the planet's life groupings, but examine here how across all animals, there's a dominance of fish across animal life forms as biomass, as well as biodiversity. Put simply, the ocean holds the most taxonomically diverse life and the greatest weight of vertebrate life on the planet. So there's a lot at stake. Stepping back and looking at the bigger global picture, aquatic species are a vitally important provider of food to people in the coming decades. And this graph shows how there's been a downward shift in the number of undernourished people in the world until about 2014, but how that trend has changed and global hunger is now on the rise again. Okay, let's get on to, so that was the first one, is why is aquatic biodiversity going to be so important for the GBF or the biodiversity plan? Um, where can fisheries and aquaculture boost target delivery? Where would we be most valuable? Well, <clears throat> if we look at the overall plan, we, we realize quickly that it's going to be a package. We know, for example, that there's three goals which relate to the theory of change and a fourth goal really about trying to enable change. We know also that there's 23 targets, which for 20, 30 deliverables involves a lot of work. And for example, just one target, target three is 104 words long. So 
even understanding this and making it highly aware amongst people that need to change their behaviours is going to be a massive challenge. And that's one of the challenges FAO is looking at at the moment. Again, if we start to look at the targets and indicators under the vision and mission, we can see that they've broken up into three areas. The first area is reducing threats. The second area is how did those balance of reducing those threats to meeting people's needs? How will that operate? Thinking more about the second aim of the CPD, which is sustainable use, and then the tools and solutions of which there are many. And obviously, many of these indicators or many of these targets with their indicators have cross-cutting considerations. In other words, doing something for one indicator can help to deliver for another. Okay, let's get into a little bit of a discussion about how fisheries might play out. Let's explore the higher priority asks of fisheries management across the biodiversity plan. So if we think of target Five, it aligns well with the central tenant of fisheries management, sustainable harvesting of wild species. And here, FAO signal on stock sustainability, overlapping with that of the SG 14.4, is accepted as the headline indicator. And this should open up opportunities for extra resourcing to deliver fisheries management and fisheries management long-held aims. However, there's a large conversation still ongoing about how to monitor progress of target five and there's many component and complementary indicators which reflect against the the multitude of descriptions of sustainable fishing which are well reflected in IEG target six if we go to target two restoration of degraded ecosystems this is an area where fisheries and biodiversity protection communities are largely aligned that they would like to see degraded systems and their components rebuilt, so fisheries rebuilding. Um, so the place of fisheries managers to build new cooperative agreements and receive recognition for fish stock rebuilding and delivery of ecosystem approaches is a great opportunity. Target three, conserve land, waters, and seas, is 104 words, as I said, and there's a lots of nuance here. It presents both challenges and opportunities for fisheries management, and here careful and and positive engagement is needed, as this target often headlines communication on the whole biodiversity plan. And there's opportunities here to frame the debate on biodiversity mainstreaming or biodiversity conservation as either something that excludes or includes people. So a very clear message here for, for fisheries management to engage in areas of this um, target, such as other effective error-based measures, OECMs. Target four, halt species extinction, links to the IUCN red list and conservation status of sp species listed in the CITES appendices. And as we know, just in COP19 last year, over 100 commercial fish species were listed, not, not necessarily because they were at risk. Some of them, the, by, by far the majority, were on look-alike basis. However, there's opportunities and, and challenges here for the fisheries community to be able to be a valued partner. In the case of meeting people's need, this is target nine and 10, that talk to management of wild species to enhance biodiversity while also maintaining mm contribution to people. Here we have the task of making a complex discussion of people nature trade offs more simple, both an opportunity and a challenge, considering the overlap across other targets, the missing baselines that would need to be established and the definitions that would need to be agreed for acceptable measures to be seen. And then there's a range of tasks spread across the tools and solutions, most notably in target 19 on funding, but also target 16 on consumption and target 18 on a removal of harmful subsidies. So what can FAO and, and partners do to enable the progress? Well, I suggest that the most important point here is to ensure that fisheries are engaged, encouraged and empowered. And here we can consider that we don't just need fisheries as a block. We need to engage small-scale fisheries, larger-scale commercial, government and UN managers, as well as inland fisheries, all with oversight of regional experts so geographical visions can also be included. 
Consider here the four R's for fisheries. We need to get good representation, ensuring fisheries actors set the narrative on their responsibility for delivering progress in the biodiversity plan. Recognition, ensuring fisheries actors get recognition for environmentally focused management, some that is already in place and some that needs to be uh, strengthened across the whole of fisheries value chains. And then resourcing, ensuring that fisheries community uh, receives the resources that is needed for them to, to carry out these activities and to establish novel policies and practices to mainstream biodiversity um, in partnering to deliver on the biodiversity plan objectives. And lastly, the resilience, ensuring delivery of mainstreaming as part of fisheries management to maintain and restore the structure and function of fisheries systems that fish production relies on. We hear a lot about the narrative uh, being of loss and, and extinction, uh, and we really need to make sure this conversation takes into account the full picture, including all food production systems and, and all of their impacts on biodiversity. And we need to move away from um, um, starting conflicts and, and bridge the use protection divide by a common looking at a common sense of threat and progressing not with naive positivity, but you know, really reflecting not places we don't want to go, but places we do want to reach with a sense of possibility. And here's a, a link that, if you get the talk, is a great talk by Earl Ellis on this subject. So what is FAO doing? Well, it's trying to make bottom-up need for progress more transparent. By doing this, it's it's worked across different sectors. If you look on the on the left-hand side of this graph, because fisheries aren't a block. They're made up of, of a range of different communities to see what their vision is and their prioritization and needs and opportunities and, and challenges for delivering into the biodiversity plan. And this is going to be formulated in an overall descriptive document, which is going to be put out for expert consultation, both in person and virtually over over the next few months so that we can bring these messages not only to Substa, but to the COP um, 16, which is going to be held in Colombia in October, November this year, speaking clearly to a fisheries audience uh, on what targets should be prioritized. Obviously, of the 23, it's easy to get lost in the crowd. What's aspirational and what's critical? What each prioritized target means. So we need to demystify the broadly worded texts. What should be measured? And as we think indicators here, indicators that will measure progress and drive investment to where it's needed. And by whom? To show who should be supported. So just to give you a little bit of an example of this work ongoing within FAO, um, the global fish stocks assessment started in the early 70s under John Gulland here. And you can see his, his references from the 70s, 71, 74, where these reports started to roll out. And we've got these reports on what stocks are overfished, which ones are in a good condition, and which ones are underfished. And this is all published in SOFIA. Now, this is made up of stock assessments across the world. And we can see how this varies between unsustainable and sustainable fish stock access. Um, across different sectors of the global fisheries community. And we've run this assessment now for so many years that there's a huge amount of information backed up in this understanding of the global status of fish stocks. However, we're not resting there. We're building capacity within countries. 80 countries so far have been, um, have been approached and worked with. And so far, we've had about 250 in-person and 80 virtually, virtual um, assessments. We've consulted, as I mentioned, with over 80 countries and moved from aggregate stock measures, which were basically describing results from 414 stocks, to getting much finer resolution by bringing in a whole range of new stocks to be able to describe the overall condition of fisheries across the world. And we're up at the moment to around 1,800 stocks, which will now develop a much clearer signal on the status of fish stocks. 
And obviously, in 24-25, we're moving into new areas, developing new capacities and helping the countries themselves and their national statistics office get both the capacity and the ability to make transparent, evidence-based, replicable, replicable assessments. Uh, with that national buy-in and with the transparency that those assessments will allow, will allow anyone to use FAO's data to run their own assessments. Okay, so what actions are needed for nature? Obviously, work with uh, production or productive sectors in the orange here, sustainable production, is really only one part of the task we need to have. We need reduced consumption. We need reducing other drivers. We have to work on climate change. We, need, we have to actually go to protection and heavy conservation. And, and all of these together will deliver what we need to, to, to bend that curve. But recognizing the importance of bringing the productive sectors in to the camp that is the <laughs> biodiversity plan, make them welcome, make them recognized and supported is, is what FAO's aim is. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of having this um, talk. And uh, please get in contact if you'd like more information. Okay, thank you so much to Dr. Friedman. Uh, last but not least, we're going to close with some remarks from Vietnam before launching into our Q&A. Uh, so Dr. Vu Duyen Hai is the head of the Capture Fisheries Division of the Vietnam Department of Fisheries. Dr. Hai does research in biostatics, biostatistics, sorry, marine biology and ecology. He got a PhD in fisheries planning and management at the Department of Planning from Aalborg University. He is a leading expert with extensive knowledge and over 25 years of experience working in the field of capture fisheries in Vietnam. Welcome, Dr. Hai. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. I'm Hai, I'm working uh, as the head of the Capture Fisheries uh, Division of the Department of Fisheries in Vietnam. Uh, I have uh, responsible ability for managing all the fishing uh, activity over throughout Vietnamese waters. Uh, so thank you very much and very happy to be uh, joined with you in this uh, uh, a video and uh, video and uh, workshop today. So, because I have a very uh, limited time to uh, present my some uh, key information about the uh, uh, fishery management in my country to achieve the target five and target uh, uh, tens of the uh, Kunming and Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. <clears throat> Uh, so next, please. Yes, so I would like to introduce uh, very briefly about uh, the Vietnamese uh, capture fisheries. We we can say the Vietnamese the capture fishery is a very small scale uh, fisheries. We have almost the fishing vessels is small scale fisheries with the length of fishing vessels is less than. 15 meters. So we can say the our capture fishery is very small scale fisheries and in the coast of fisheries also. Uh, however, we uh, catch, uh, I think it's a higher uh, production. Uh, we, our uh, total uh, sea, uh, capture fisheries is increased. Uh, in the past uh, three decades, the capture fisheries, the total catch of the capture fishery is increased uh, and it uh, with the um, stable rate. However, after the 1990s, the rate, the high, um, the increased uh, rate is um, less and less. However, we also encourage to develop the aquaculture. So the total <clears throat> uh, production of aquaculture in increased so far is more than a half 
of the total fishery production in my country. So that is our uh, strategies and the objective of our policy to develop the aquacultures and reduce the capture fishery to protect our um, marine aquatic uh, environment and ecosystem and so that is the uh, overall objective of our fishery policies. And the next please. And uh, we can say we we have the diverse ecosystem uh, in the Vietnamese waters. Uh, in terms of the marine waters, we have uh, four main ecosystems. That's the um, mangrove forest in the, along the coast from the north to the south. And we also have the seagrass ecosystem that is very um, sensitive and they uh, fit for many, many species in our uh, marine uh, habitats. And we also have the coral reefs ecosystem along the coast, especially in the central areas. And we also have the uh, uh, the beach, the Thai uh, areas along the coast. And we can divide into more than 10 uh, fishing grounds with the different uh, um, ecosystem um, factors. So to protect the fish stock, we have divided uh, divide the Vietnamese water into uh, the fishery management areas you can see in the maps on the on the right, so that we we based on the fish stock status of each um, management fishery uh, areas, we will uh, decide uh, how many fishing vessels can be I uh, can operate there and how many a. Uh, a, a fish we can catch in each the fishery management areas. So that to to achieve the um, sustainable uh, management in the specific area. And next, please. Um, in in terms of policies of Vietnamese fish, capture fishery, we manage the fishery in to separate planning system, that is the fishery planning system and general social economic planning system. And in each system, we have four levels. The first level it is the national levels. The national level, we provide policies and regulation for throughout the countries. And the second, the second level that is the provincial levels. The uh, the provincial level, they provide the policies and strategy for managing and developing country uh, uh, fisheries in the provincial levels. And the first level that is district, and the first that is communes, they have a policy and have. A, responsibility to implement the policies and regulation from the national level and provincial levels on service. Uh, on the, uh, the management system, we will impact to the local fishery communities and all the fishing activity to impact on the fishery um, uh, uh, fishing communities and fish stop in the management uh, fishery management area also. Besides the system, we also have uh, the, some uh, scientific providers, that is the research institute to provide the scientific yeah, advice for, for, for manager, uh, for management uh, system. Next, please. In terms of the legal framework, we have the fishery law adopted by the national parliament in uh, 2017. And to guide, to implement the fishery law, we have uh, two decrees issued by the national government. 
and we also have with 10 circular issues by the Minister of Ministry uh, of Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, be beside that, we also have many resolutions and decisions of the provincial government to manage the fisheries and aquaculture in the national levels and in provincial level also. Next, please. And based on the fishery law and decrease and circular, we can summarize uh, the fishery management system in Vietnam. We divided into three zones, the offshore areas, the coastal and inshore areas. Uh, the fishery law um, size the provincial government to manage the fishery activity and agriculture in the coastal and Eastern Jones. The Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development have a, a responsibility to manage the fishery and aquaculture in the offshore area. And the fishery management um, regulation in Vietnam based on a combination regime. We limit the fishing license in the in, in each zone. In coastal, we will decide how many fishing vessels uh, are allowed to, to, to do fishing. In the, as, uh, as well, in the um, inshore area, how many fishing vessels should be licensed to operate in this area and the offshore on those. And we also limit the total catch for some individual species, for example, tuna, squid and anchovies. And we also apply some technical measures such as we oppose the mess size for some fish uh, for some fishing gear. We also establish MPA and um, refugia fishery refugias and we also oppose the close area to fish and and also close area yeah uh, in some months or years to protect the fisheries resource. And we also, in, uh, we developed the national um, plan of the of action to uh, combat IUU. We also implement the, the PFMA increase of FAO to combat IUU in, in Vietnam. Yes. <clears throat> well, next please. And, we, and besides implement the fishery regulation, we also have some national initiative for fisheries. For example, we um, established uh, uh, and uh, conduct some surveys uh, for the fisheries resource over the countries uh, five years uh, uh, times with the five year cycles. And we also uh, um, uh, investigate the habitats and the marine ecosystem to identify which species should be protected and should habitat, uh, which habitat we should, uh, we have to protect and conserve for uh, sustainable development. And we also conduct stock assessment for specific population of stock uh, every five years. And we also conduct the um, uh, annual landing survey at the landing site throughout the countries uh, along the more than 100 fishing ports uh, in the countries. And we also um, established 16 MPAs and refugia and close areas along the coast. You can see uh, the positions of the MPA and refugia in, uh, throughout the Vietnamese waters. Next, please. Mm, and we also uh, establish the um, vessel monitoring system for vessels of beyond the 15 uh, meters. We have uh, nearly 29,000 uh, fishing vessels with the length more than 15 vessels. All the vessels have to install 
is on the VMS so that the government can see fishing vessels, whereas the fishing vessels so that we can monitor and, and manage and control them when they op operate at sea. And we also uh, applied the uh, electronic logbook and electronic uh, cash documentation traceability so that we can we can know the fish uh, was be caught by which vessels, which by uh, uh, fishmen and by uh, and when and by which fishing year, so that we can chase the sea seafood um, caught in Vietnamese waters, and we also um, uh, designed 15, 15 tree fishing port for verifying catches and 14 port to implement the post uh, state measures agreements. Yeah. Next, please. And you also uh, uh, be uh, a membership of ma uh, many, many agreement, uh, internet uh, agreement and international organization. For example, we uh, ratified the own clause uh, in uh, 1982. We also ratified the UNFSA uh, agreement. We, we are a member of FAO, a member of PSMA. We also is the uh, CNM of WCPFC. We are a member of CPEC, ASEAN IEU, RPO IEU. We also have many uh, mandatory cooperation with the neighboring countries like China, Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, and so on. Next, please. And with uh, the, I think that is a very comprehensive uh, policies and regulation to achieve the target uh, five and target 10 uh, of the framework. We also achieve the uh, achievement. We have achievement to, um, to, to develop uh, sustainability our fishery uh, our fisheries and we also have uh, participate with many country many countries and international corporate uh, organization to uh, manage uh, our fisheries however we also identify some issues and still have concerns in fishery management in my countries the first one that is the negative impacts of climate change. We would like to collaborate with you and other uh, stakeholders to reduce and adapt with the impact of climate change in the future. And the second one that is, as I mentioned before, our fishery, that is a very small scale fishery and almost the fishermen is very poor. So we need to help them to change the um, livelihood. And now we, we are implementing the policy to reduce the fishing effort and we uh, provide and encourage the small scale uh, fishermen to uh, shift to the non-fishing uh, livelihood. And we also, uh, uh, faced with the degradation of aquatic habitats and ecosystem as the other neighboring countries in the region. We also um, can identify some indicator of the overcapacity and over exploitation of fish stock in some areas. And we also uh, uh, um, identify some indicator of the loss of the post harvest on board so that in the future we can improve the livelihood of the fishermen through application of uh, new technology to help the fishermen to uh, improve the quality of the fish. And we also have uh, insufficient data and information for fishery management uh, we also have a poor infrastructure for fishery management in the uh, in the local levels, and we 
and so have a poor enforcement system because we have many many fishing vessels and and they distribute along the coast very very long cost so, so that it faces with it to improve the enforcement uh, of regulation at the fishing community in the future uh, we also have effectiveness of the regional and bilateral cooperation uh, in reality, we try to collaborate, collaborate with them, but the effectivity is still a challenge for us. In the future, we have to improve the effectiveness of the of cooperation with the other countries. Oh, next, please. So that is uh, that is some very key information and brief uh, information from the Vietnamese the capture fisheries. Thank you very much. I look forward to have further cooperation with you. Thank you very much. And thank have you so any questions? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Hai. Uh, thank, thank you so much to all of our speakers for the engaging presentations. Um, so we're a little bit short on time. So um, we're going to probably have time for maybe one question. Um, mm. and, um, and so let's see. Um, Let's see. So um, here's one. Um, so what processes are underway to report on progress to achieving targets five and 10? Are countries already identifying, listing, reporting fisheries or areas that count? Yes, thank you very much for the question. You know, because in the uh, uh, workshop, I have uh, enough time to, to present uh, the achievement to our process and our uh, strategy to achieve the target five and target ten. But generally, you can we can see that the biology, the biology is uh, um, con conservation of uh, biodiversity that is the priority in developing policy in my countries, and we now. To, to revise on the fishery regulation to uh, reduce um, uh, minimum minimums, uh, minimize of the impacts of the human activity, especially for the capture of uh, capture uh, fishing activity on the habitat and the uh, natural ecosystem, and we also uh, develop the uh, aquaculture uh, strategy to avoid the pollution pollution in uh, of, uh in throughout the water water bodies not just the marine fishery and marine waters but but in the fresh uh, water body on cells yes okay. um miss lim would you like to respond as well Okay, um, I know we're over time, but we do have a, a few really great questions in, in the Q&A session, uh, in the Q&A box. Um, let's see. Um, how about uh, this one? Uh, can you give an example of the challenges that you encountered on regional and bilateral cooperation on, on fisheries? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, my colleagues from... Uh... Uh, Malaysia and other country that is a neighboring country with us. Do you know, uh, uh, I think the most uh, challenging for us that is how we can um, have a cooperation mechanism at the regional levels. For example, the Asian IUUs are the ship deck and, and the other regional forums. Uh, because I think we have the same uh, history and we, we have the same situation of the development of the fisheries. However, we cannot have um, effective channel to, to exchange information, especially for the um, um, 
for some um, hot night to exchange information if exchange information for the fishing activity at sea because the fishmen uh, they operate in the very small scale fishery because the, we have the, the the sea boundaries with the many countries especially for Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and China. But sometimes, you know, the Vietnamese fishermen and 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 the foreigner uh, fishermen also can uh, go in into the disputed areas. But the disputed areas among the country is not defined. So, so sometimes uh, the the authority of the neighboring con neighboring country also uh, sees our uh, fishing vessels in the disputed uh, disputed areas, and we have not established the mechanism to exchange and address the issues. That is the in terms of the capture fisheries in the disputed areas, and we also have some. Um, advance in the aquacultures, especially in the marine uh, culture. So, but we have not uh, established the, the canal to collaborate, to share the information and transfer the technology to develop the um, blue technologies and, and uh, circulate the technology to develop sustainable uh, the fisheries the capture fishery and aquaculture also. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much, Dr. Hai. Um, yeah, would any other panelists like to share an answer to anything? Otherwise, um, because we are out of time, um, I would like to close it up. However, there were several very interesting questions in the Q&A. Uh, so in the follow-up email with the recording, um, we can include some answers to those questions as well. Um, all right, so on that note, um, I really wanna thank so much, um, thank everybody for uh, their thoughtful remarks and the questions to advance biodiversity goals across Asia. If you would like to get in touch or if anybody has any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me by email and um, I can ensure that it gets to the appropriate person, um, one of the panelists, if anybody thinks of anything. Um, so yes, thank you very much again to everybody and I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of your day or evening. Um, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.